If you like fine jewelry, then you're going to love what we're about to do today. Coming up on Jewel School, guest expert Jackie Trudy introduces us to the fascinating world of art clay, where this special material magically transforms into pure silver. You'll learn how to craft gorgeous pendants, earrings, and rings that are truly one of a kind. We'll shape, mold, coil, and sculpt as if working with normal clay. But in the end, elegant 99.9% .9 fine silver jewelry. So get ready to explore the amazing world of art clay. I'm Margot Potter, and this is Jewel School. Hello and welcome to Jewel School. I'm Margot Potter, resident jewelry making expert at Jewel School, and I am so extremely excited about what we're gonna be exploring today. Art Clay opens up new creative possibilities for the jewelry designer. And we're gonna be joined in studio by metal clay master artist and a true renaissance woman, Jackie Trudy. Jackie, welcome to Jewel School. Pleasure to be here. So let's sit down and talk to us. What is Art Clay? Art Clay is 99.9 .9 fine silver that is mixed with an organic non-toxic binder and water. And you work with it just like any other um, craft clay. You can roll it out and stamp it and texturize it. And when you dry it, and then fire it. What makes it clay burns away and you're left with 99.9 .9 fine silver. Which is purer than sterling. Absolutely, it has no copper in it. Wow. So you used to be a registered nurse. That's right, I was an operating room nurse. Um, I already had a hobby, I was a glass artist. And after I saw a demonstration of art clay, knew that this is what I wanted to do. So it literally changed your life. It did, it did. I went from science and uh, being in the operating room to running a full-time business uh, and being an artist. I think that's fascinating. Thank you. All right, next, we're gonna take a look at all of the tools and materials you'll need to get started working with art clay. So Jackie, let's talk a little more detail about the clay. What are the different forms that art clay takes? It's a very good question. Art clay has four basic formulas. Okay. It comes in a lump clay, which is like this, and it's actually soft and you roll it out. We have the standard formula that came out originally that is between 1600 and 1472. Temperature? Temperature, which yes, is yes. Fahrenheit, okay. degrees Fahrenheit. Then we have the uh, low fire. This allows you to fire down to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit in a kiln when you need to fire clay with uh, glass or porcelain or glazes, things so that like that. So that expanded your potential. It expanded clay. the potential, so now you could use it with a lot more gemstones. And then we have the slow dry formula. The slow dry formula has the, the binder a little bit different, and it allows you, no matter where you live, to work with the clay three to four times longer. So if you're working in a very moist climate or working in a very dry climate, it will let you work longer. From here, we go to the syringes. And the syringes are actually pre-filled with five or 10 grams of clay that it feels like a spackle and you use this to decorate and to join things together. So this brings you back to your nursing taste. Yes, it does. It's always wonderful to keep <laughs> having a syringe. Now you have the paste type, and the paste is generally used to connect things together. And the last silver clay we have is called paper type. And originally in Japan, it was used for origami. See, this fascinates me. This is very cool stuff. It's one single piece, and you take it out, and it feels like vinyl. And you actually fold it into cranes, into whatever you want. I want to play with that. It's neat. It's neat. So you talk about drying times, mm -hmm. and the clay has a, a, a short drying time. Mm -hmm. What can I do or what can we do to extend that drying time and keep it moist? There are a whole lot of ways. People come okay. up with new ways all the time. And I just have four quick ones here. One is just having a spritzer available and you just spray the clay and it's very fine mist so it, it doesn't make it muddy. Plus if you're feeling a little warm, you can just kind of... There you go. Some people actually use little humidifiers. If they live really? in Vegas or, or someplace really dry, they'll have a little humidifier right by their work surface. Interesting. Which is, I think, very clever. Um, this is, my, I think, the most innovative that I've seen. And they took a sponge and glued it to the bottom of a glass. And then you wet the sponge and you put it on something flat. And then when you put your extra clay, excess clay or little pieces under there, then it keeps it moist the whole it's time. It's like a clay terrarium. It's like a clay <laughs> humidor. Yes, that's very 
very interesting. And then this is basically the same thing. It's got a little rubber gasket on it. So it seals it in. It seals it in. Okay. And this last one Which is... Which makes me think of a tiny little cake. Yes, it's it's <laughs> like a mouse cake. I love it. It is uh, just a... I think originally it's for butter. Okay. And uh, you just put a little sponge in here again, or just the clay, and by keeping this top on, it keeps the moisture inside the vehicle and doesn't let the clay dry out. So we've got the clay, we know how to keep it moist, now we need to take a look at tools. All right. The first thing that you need when you're working with our clay is some kind of emollient, some kind of release that's going to keep um, your tools and your hands nice and moist. We use olive oil. You can use badger bomb, bag bomb, something like that, anything that's not petroleum based. Okay. And you not only have it on your hands, but normally on your roller too, so that the clay won't stick to it. Typically we roll out the clay. And so you need a roller, and this is just an acrylic roller. You can use PVC pipe, you can use anything that you really need to. Then to keep the clay a typical distance, a typical thickness, so you don't make it too thin, these are called slats. Uh, people use playing cards, nice. you use a whole version of things. Then what you roll it on is really important because if you have something very delicate, you don't wanna have to move it after you finish to put it in the dryer or whatever. So these are actually Teflon coated strips. A lot of these things are baking friendly. They are, except we make sure that ours are very thin because we actually use them to um, oh, use yeah, you over can templates. See that. Right, so that's important for us. Then we have a rubber block. It is exactly what it looks like. And it's used, one, because it raises your wrist up above the surface of the table and actually makes it ergonomically better for you. But also because if you're filing, it gives you all these planes to file on. This is a ring mandrel, and it actually has two mandrels on a stand, and then this one is tapered, which means it goes in a continuous taper. So if you take your ring sizer around, you can make your ring any size, and we're gonna show you how to do that. Right. Why do we have straws? Straws, straws are just the best thing in the whole wide world. <laughs> They're high tech. This is your most high tech tool. Here. I'm so proud of these straws <laughs> because when you're gonna make holes, it's easier to make them in the clay. So you have these kinds of straws that you roll over, make coils over, and then these to make holes. And you can get them from any number of sources. Speaking of high tech tools, what is this for? Oh, that's very high tech. Now that we've uh, actually put holes and we've uh, made of the shape of our clay, right. now we have to dry it. Okay. Because it has to be totally dry before it's fired. So we have a hair dryer in a box. <laughs> this way you don't have to stand there and dry and your it. clay and hold it. You have an open box and you just put things down on the, on the uh, bottom shelf there. Here's something a little higher tech. This is my favorite and it's a food dehydrator. It's really the best because the machine that creates the heat and the air is in the back okay. and will flow forward over all of the trays. And there's actually segmented trays there's in here. There's five trays in there. Right here. Right, and your pieces will not warp either. They'll dry very evenly. So once our clay is dry, what do we do next? Now you really get to refine it because once it's dry, it's dry forever. So now you can use your files and you can file your pieces, file the edges. You can use the sandpapers and make everything nice and smooth. You can refine your piece if you need to add something or take something off. So what, whatever comes from that, let's say we, we file mm -hmm. this and we sand it, there's dust. Is that recyclable or reusable? Oh, absolutely recyclable. You don't throw anything away. I love that about our So clay. I always take my little scraper and I scrape across and get all the little dust and pilings and lift that up and you put that right back in your paste jar. That's terrific. So you never run out. You keep adding a little water and it's as good as new. So once you've done that, now you're ready to fire it. All right. And there are three basic ways of firing our clay. All right. Okay, the most popular way is with the torch, and that's a butane torch. Which, you mean just a butane torch? Just a regular, it's a cooking torch to make creme brulee or whatever. I but like that. creme brulee and our clay. And our clay. <laughs> And then another way of firing is with a gas stovetop. Okay. It can be in your kitchen gas stovetop, and we're gonna so talk about right that here. too, but this is portable. This is a little um, gas stovetop that's also butane. Almost like a little Bunsen burner. It's like a little Bunsen burner, and it's got a stainless steel net on top, so we're gonna show you how to fire using that too. All right. Very easy, um, but another option. 
And then what's this? That is a programmable electric kiln. So this is the big daddy. This is the big daddy. This is what you use when you are being very specific in what you're doing and you have to fire something at 1200 because of a gemstone or because of glass, okay. or you want to use our clay with glass and you have to be very careful. So once it's fired, then what do we do with it? Then you're going to polish it. And when you fire our clay, it won't look like silver. It'll be white. And the reason it's white is because the silver particles are standing straight See, up. this is fascinating to me. Yeah, well. Because I th always thought it was just kind of clay residue. Yeah, no, no, no. So then it's more like raw silver. So that you start to polish it. And this is a stainless steel brush. Right. You can use brass as well. And you just polish the piece by rubbing it. And as you start to rub it, you start to see the silver color come up. And the flatter you make the particles, the shinier the piece is. So you can leave it matte finish, which is just brushing it, or you can polish it. And there are any number of ways of polishing it. The easiest is with the agate burnisher. And this is actually polished agate on a bamboo stick. And you compress that top layer of silver. And as that silver gets compressed, it shines up just like chrome. It's wow. just beautiful. And another way, if you have something that's very uh, ornate and uh, difficult to get into grooves and cracks and crevices, you can use a jewelry tumbler. And then finally, we have metal polish. This is a really significant tool because even when it comes out of the tumbler, it's very shiny. It's still maybe bumped up a notch mm -hmm. to be really blue shiny, blue silver. And um, that on a polishing cloth with just a little bit of that polishing liquid will make it extremely, extremely bright. We call it a mirror finish <laughs> because you actually can see yourself yeah. in it it's so bright. Wow, that's a lot to remember. It sure is, but we'll be breaking it down into small packets so when we're doing the projects, it'll help a lot. Well, thank you so much for explaining all to us. You can find our clay and the tools and supplies at jewelschool.com. There you can find all of your art clay needs, whether you're looking for a single package of clay or a complete all-inclusive starter kit. Discover everything you need and more for our clay at jewelschool.com. Right, let's get started on our first project, Summertime Leaf Pendant. I can't wait to start the first project, the Summertime Leaf Pendant. So Jackie, where do we begin? We begin by getting all of our equipment together so we don't have anything to run for once we open our clay. So we gotta be ready to roll. Ready to roll. Okay. So we're, first we have our olive oil. In our makeup dispenser. In our makeup dispenser. <laughs> <laughs> we have some paste. We may or may not need it, but it's always handy. We have a paintbrush for the same reason. We need the paste. I have a craft knife here that we'll use once we need have the clay out to trim. Sure. And I have a syringe here. Again, I'm not sure I'm going to need it, but it's always handy. And as long as the tip is under the water, it will never dry out. I have a straw here for putting the holes in. I'm gonna use that one. And another straw for the coil that we're going to make and the um, Teflon coated work surface that we use and the rigid underboard that we use so that we don't damage the tabletop. Oh. This is the push mold that I'm going to use to make the leaf. Uh, it doesn't have to be a push mold. You can actually roll out the clay and then press it, a stamp into it, a leaf stamp. And then cut around it. And or, cut around okay. it. You can also get a real leaf and put it on top of your rolled clay and roll the leaf into the clay. Right. So first, a little bit of olive oil on my hands, and then I'm gonna put olive oil in the space. Always have to use some kind of release when you're using stamps or molds or textures, anything like that. Now we wouldn't wanna use petroleum products, right? Never petroleum products because they react with the plastics okay. and also with the metal clay. So we should stick with our olive oil. Stick with olive oil or badger balm, something like that. All right. Got everything ready? Yep. Now's the time to open up my package. All right, we're opening the clay. Oh, drum roll, please. Okay, that was a very solid. pathetic drum roll, sorry. Well, you know. <laughs> All right, so here's about 10 grams of clay. Look at that, it looks like clay. It looks like clay, there's just nothing wow. to be done for it. And when you need to hydrate it a little bit, which means that maybe it's gotten a little dry. So I'm just putting a little bit of water. This is just plain tap water. You see how I'm only using two fingers from each yeah. hand because you don't want to uh, use any more hands on it than you need to. Okay. So then I'm going to take a little pinch off for the coil. 
because I want to make sure I have enough. All right. And that goes, always take the time to put your clay away. Never just lay it on the table because it will be dry in just a few minutes and you'll be unhappy with yourself. So now you go right to the part where you put the clay in the mold. And you're just pushing the clay That's into that push mold. All I'm doing. Simple, simple. And I'm going to take the time to actually do it as best I can. You don't want to slide through and make this too sloppy okay. because you actually want to make it as even as you can. And the more pressure you put on it, the better you're going to get all of that detail that was on the other side mm -hmm. because you can trim all of the excess from this. It's not a big deal. So the next thing you're going to do is release it. Right. And because it's flexible and it already has the release on it, you should just like that. Look at that. And you see that it's not perfect around the edges. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that. If you want, you can trim a little bit, but you don't want to disturb the texture. So you don't want to spend any more time in the wet stage than you need to. Okay because you're gonna lose, it's gonna start drying out and then you get frustrated and you try to move it back and then it gets muddy and it's best just to get it in the bare form, put it in the dryer and then once it's dry, it's dry forever, okay. then you take your time. Are we gonna put the holes in it? We're gonna put the holes in it okay. and that's the last thing you're going to do. So if it's going to hang like this, kind of like that, off to the side a little bit, you wanna put the holes right here so that the beads dangle nicely right. down one side. So I get my straw. Your handy dandy high tech. My handy dandy high tech straw. straw. There we go. And I'm going to make five holes. Okay. So I want to do the middle one first. And when you're making a hole, you want to turn it a little bit when you press it in. And you want to make sure you get at least an eighth of an inch from the edge. Because you always have to remember, this is going to shrink 8 to 10%. And if you get it too close to the edge, when it shrinks, it might break through. Oh, yes, so, that would be bad. No, that would be bad. Okay, there's three. There's four. And there's five. There we go. All right. So I'm going to take a look at it one more time. Hold it up. I think that'll work fine. And now this entire thing is going to go into the dryer. Now I use a dehydrator uh, because like I said in the intro, I like the fact that it blows everything from the back and it's going to dry very evenly. So all I do on this is just take this down, take my entire Teflex, and I'm going to slide it right into the top. That is going to dry between 10 and 15 minutes, depending on the temperature you put it up to and the ambient air in the room, okay. things like that. And there's ways to test. There's ways to test whether it's dry or not. Um, what you do is you can put it on any piece of uh, plastic or glass or metal, and you hold it there for about 10 seconds f directly from the dryer while the dryer is still hot. And after 10 seconds, you just take it away. And if there's a condensation ring, it means that there's still moisture in it. It has to be absolutely bone dry before you fire it. And you want that because I have fired clay that wasn't dry and it was not a pleasant experience. No, because what happens is the moisture inside the clay then expands, becomes yeah. steam and will actually burst So it's piece. very important that you get your clay dry before we get to the next stage. Right. So after 10 or 15 minutes, you open it up and you have a piece that's dry. And if you look now, it's very solid, it's rigid, but oh, it's yet beautiful. it's very fragile because it's still clay. Right. All the clay is there. But now what you want to do is you want to get your files and you want to get some um, sanding paper and you want to really spruce it up. When you are filing and sanding art clay and it's dry, if I hold it down here and file it up here, oh. it's going to break. Ah, well, that would be because Well, because of course, because that's too much tension on it. Right. So you have to hold it right up here. And that's why we like to use these small files so that they don't take a big chunk out of it because you really have to get used to the pressure that you have to put on it. So we're just 
taking a look, and you'll see the stuff coming off. Yeah, this is really interesting. I have a little stencil brush here. You can use a dry paintbrush because you see all of this look coming this. off. It's, coming, it's almost like it's coming to life. And remember, you have to keep all of this because you're going to put it back in your jar. Recycle, recycle, recycle because it's pure silver and you don't want to waste it at all. Well, and the price of silver is constantly rising, so save it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And again, all you need to do is put it in your, um, your paste jar, a little bit of water, and you're ready to go. So this isn't in bad shape at all because we had cut a little off when it was wet. And again, you see how I'm holding it right up yeah. to where I'm filing. And you're not gonna take your eyes off of it. You're not gonna be distracted because when you're distracted, that's when accidents happen. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you, if something were to break off of this, the only thing I would need to do is get some paste, put it back on my Teflon, use the paste as glue, put the piece back on, put it back in the dryer. Okay. And then just keep sanding because until you fire it, you can always fix it. You can always add things, subtract things, fill things. Not a problem at all. There we go. And see, look at all this that yeah, I've got. Yeah, that's amazing how much. It, it really adds wow. up. It really does. So I am going to just finish these little edges here. All right. I've got a round file here. So you could go it's in and smooth It's absolutely those. round. Yeah, because you never want to put something square into something round and the opposite. Because, you'll yeah, you'll get all kinds of edges and you can break it real easily. So that looks not bad that at all. That looks fabulous. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is take my block. Remember we talked about the block? Yes. Put it on the block and then take my different gauges. And right here is fine. This one is the is the coarsest okay. of the two. And you don't want to sand it too much because you'll sand off yeah, your you leaf detail. Texture, yeah. Right? But you just want to Make it smooth so that when it's fired, you don't have a lot of sanding to do afterwards because it's much harder filing uh, so sanding. With this, clay. you really want to do all that finishing work, that, that sanding, prior to firing it. Oh, absolutely. Right. You want 80% um, of the work done before you fire it, maybe even 90. And then after you fire it, you should only have to just brush it and polish it the way you want. You shouldn't have to do any, you know, really difficult filing or um, gouging or anything like that because all that is so much easier to do when it's clay. Okay, and even now this, you can see I've got clay on here. All I have to do, and the clay will come off. Waste not, want not. I have gotten so, <laughs> so obsessive about this. So now actually, the next step is to put the coil on. All right. And we're all set to do that. Remember, I had just that little bit left that I pinched off. There it is. Oh, okay. Remember? I had yeah, that. I do recall. So I want to make sure I don't have any cracks in that, and I'm going to roll it. So it's like making a snake, like you did when you were a kid. It's just like making class. a snake, yeah. And you can see that there's not a lot of cracking here, but I am going to use my water and just moisten it just a little bit. If there's cracking, we should be concerned or no. not concerned or Actually, no? Actually, no. Okay. Um, if there's cracking, you're just going to fill it in afterwards with some paste or some okay. syringe. But if you keep it moist, I need it longer. A little bit longer. Because we're gonna make a coil. And we're gonna make a coil around this straw. Yet another high-tech straw. Another. This is blue. <laughs> I love this. I think it's great. You use what tools you have at hand. I'm going to measure this first. Okay. This is going to be perfect, I believe. So I am going to take my um, little paste here. So this acts as a bonder or it's a glue it's, of some yeah, kind. Yeah, and actually it's great that it doesn't unless you use something like this because you can make um, chains that each link can fire together, but they won't stick. Love so you can that. actually use it to your advantage. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a little paste on here. That means when I put the coil on, the coil's gonna stick. So I'm just going to do that. Then get my straw. Okay. I've got the coil that I started on the main body of the leaf, and then I've got this straw. So I am just gonna start winding this coil around the straw. And remember I said not to worry about this cracking right. because you're, we're gonna fix it when it's dry. 
but I'm going to leave this straw in here while I dry it. Oh. Okay. So I get a little bit of water, a little bit of paste, and I'm putting a layer of the paste on it for two reasons. One, to join these together, and two, to fill in those little micro um, cracks that had started to appear. Because this is not slow dry clay, this is regular low fire. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it like that. Now we're gonna put it in the dryer. You could do some banana chips while you're drying. Yeah. <laughs> And again, that's going to dry about 10 or 15 minutes until that coil is really, really nice and solid and dry. When it's dry, I'm going to go in and take it out. And before it gets cool, we're going to take the clay cutter that we have from our set and put this on. And now we're going to count to 10. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we look to see if there's a cloud of condensation. Ah. And this will tell us whether there's still moisture in the piece or not. And okay. there is none. So we're actually so we're ready good. to roll. We're ready to roll. What I'm gonna do is very carefully take the straw out. So I'm just turning this very slowly. Because when the clay hasn't been fired, it's still in a clay state. It's still in a clay state, okay. so it's fairly brittle. And it does shrink just a little bit while it's drying. So you just have to turn the straw while you're pulling on it. Almost there. There we go. You did it. Yay. Yay. And the last thing I'm going to do before we fire this is just take the sandpaper one last time and go over my edges to make sure any fine lines I've got in there come out. Because if you don't make it smooth now, it will not be smooth after you fire it. And this looks pretty good. I'm using my stencil brush again just to put the, uh, the dust down on the table. I do want to take my round file and go through my holes like this just to make sure that I don't have any little sharp edges in there. And they look good. All right. And now we're ready to torch it. Time to bring out the fire. We're going to get a timer. All right. So that we can time the actual length of the sintering process. Right. Okay. How long should it be? Two minutes. Okay. Because this is about 10 grams. All right. And 10 grams is about two minutes. I'm going to now take the firing equipment and move it forward here. I'll help you out. I'm just gonna move some of these things out of the way so you can. Yep. Yeah. And this is a compressed vermiculite brick. It does not let the heat go through it. It will just stay right where we point All the right. torch, okay? And this is the torch. It's a butane torch, you fill it from the bottom. Okay. So before I start a project like this that I know that it's going to be on for two minutes, I'm going to fill this. All right. All right. And you set the nozzle in place and you push down hard and listen for the change. Oh, right there. I got it. And then you know it's full. Okay, you wanna put the butane away from the torch. Yeah, that right? probably be good. That's idea. a good safety thing. <laughs> and then you're gonna take your piece and just put it in the middle. And now we're gonna start firing. You're gonna see a little smoke and flame as the binder burns off. Okay. And that's the non-toxic binder, but you can see that there is a little flame there. Once that is all gone, once it stops smoking, the binder's gone. There you go, and it's just gonna turn white. All right, now we're going to wait here and just keep going until we see it start to glow. And can we have the uh, lights down, please? So we're not quite there yet, but you'll see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. You see how it's glowing? Yep. And nice deep glow. Okay, now we're going to start the timer for two minutes. And it curls up often because at this point, it's shrinking the eight to 10%. Mm -hmm. So it will relax again. 
but you can see that nice glow. That's the glow you need before you set the timer. As soon as you get that glow, you can start timing. Is there a certain distance the torch should be from the metal? The distance the torch should be from the piece is really related to the color. Okay. If it gets too bright and it starts looking like it's gonna shimmer, which means that you're nearing the melting point mm -hmm. of the piece, then you pull back. Okay. If you lose the glow, then you go forward. So you are determining by the distance that you're staying at that sintering temperature. We made it! All right, so you turn this off, set it aside safely, and looks Don't good. Don't touch it. Don't touch it, never touch it. What you can do is you can quench it in water if you don't have any stones in here or no glass or, or oh, nothing else. Okay. Because if you quench a stone, it you will crack, crack it, right? Yeah. So you can take the tweezers and some water and just dip it in glass, not plastic. There you go, you hear that? Yeah. And the lights can come up. Thank you very much. Look at that. And now, because I quenched it, see it's cool, can I can hold it. Hold it. So we're just gonna set that aside. We're gonna dry this. Okay. Bring the block up. It'll still be warm, but it's not hot anymore. And you can see that it's not really silver yet. Yeah, now this is the part you were talking about, the fibers are standing mm -hmm. up? Where the silver particles are standing straight up. They're not flattened yet. So this is a stainless steel brush. Right. And as we begin to, to brush it. This is the part that just blows my mind. Look at that. It's silver now. It's amazing. It still amazes me after 10 years. It's like magic. And it's not the coating of silver. It's just solid silver, pure silver. Wow. Through and through, all through the way. Through and through. So now this first step, you're making a brush silver. And they could leave it with they that brush finish matte, if they right. like that. Right. But to polish it, they can take this agate burnisher uh -huh. that we talked about, where it's polished agate on a bamboo stick, and they can compress that top layer of silver. Look at how shiny that is. Wow. And the last thing we're going to do is add the beads to the holes that we made. Okay. So I'm going to hand this to you. Oh, so my that gosh. That is amazing. Look at how beautiful that is. Can you believe we started out with clay? Yeah, started out as and clay. And ended up with something that beautiful. Wow. But it's going to be even more beautiful. We're going to make it even more beautifuler. <laughs> okay, so I've actually got another sample over here that I've started. I'm going to get everything out of the way so we can go ahead and finish up. What I did here was anybody who makes jewelry has what we call bead soup. Those are little odds and ends that are kind of sitting in a bin of one bead of this and two bead of that, and this is the perfect way to utilize it. So I've already attached four of my dangles, and I'm gonna make the final one, okay? So I put this down. I'm using a head pin. I'm gonna slide my beads onto the head pin, and I already have my beads picked out. I'm gonna slide on a blue bead at the bottom, a green bead in the center, and a pink bead. And of course, your bead soup is different from my bead soup, but this project works, works best with smaller beads, two to three millimeters. Okay, let me get my round nose pliers, and we're gonna do a coil dangle. So we come in with our pliers. You see how I'm grasping it right at the top of the head pin, and I'm gonna bend the wire at a 90 degree angle. You see what I did there? Now I'm gonna move the pliers up one half step. I don't have to remove them. I'm taking this tail, and I'm gonna bend it over until it can't go any further. Now I gently move the pliers, these are all gentle movements, and I pull it across, and now I've got a loop. Can you see what I've done? Now you can either grasp this with chain nose pliers or do it with your fingertips. I'm gonna grab my chain nose pliers, and what I'm doing now is coiling this wire down until it's flush to the top of the bead. So let me get a hold of that. And can you see how I'm coiling, coiling, tightly until I get to the top of the bead and I've hit it. Adjust things and I go in with my flush cutters and I cut off that tail, like so. But there's still a little bit of wire poking out and that's when Mr. Chain Nose Pyre comes in and tucks it under. And I've made my little coil dangle. So let me attach this to the bottom hole in our pendant using a jump ring. And you've seen these before. Find the opening, I'm gonna grasp it on both sides with my 
Jane knows pliers. I'm going to open it laterally. We're going to slide this into that bottom hole on our pendant. We're going to add our little dangle, and we want that coil to be facing forward. And the last thing we're going to do is close this with tension. And basically, I'm just moving these two ends together, brushing them past one another once, and clicking them into place. And now our dangle is going to stay there until we remove it. And that is it. It's beautiful. It is absolutely exquisite. I can't wait to get to the next project. Yeah, we can get going right away. Celtic heart ring, right? Celtic heart ring. All right, let's rock and roll. Let's get ready to start project number two, the Celtic heart ring. Okay, Jackie, tell us what we're gonna be using with this project. All right, we're gonna be using an underlay, which we did in the last project, the Teflon coated work surface. Right. I have here a mold, and it's difficult, if you can see the pattern here, oh, might be that. easier here. And I did this because it's going to be the ring band. So it'll give it some texture. Just give it a little bit of texture so that it won't be just flat and boring. This is the ring mandrel, and you can see that it's got a stand and it's gonna be hands-free. It's a great piece. Um, I have a pair of scissors because I need to cut a strip of Teflex, and that's going to go around the mandrel so that the clay won't stick to the mandrel. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I have a mold, and this is called the Celtic heart mold, and this is going to be the top piece of the ring. I love that. You know, I'm a Celtic background, so I love Celtic things. Yeah, so. I do too. We have the paste. Okay. We have a syringe with a green tip, a paintbrush, the ubiquitous olive oil. We have tweezers. This is the ring sizer. This is like this a little belt. Neat. So I'll show you how to use this okay. in a minute. Um, I have a pencil and a craft knife, my slats, and a roller. Our friend, the little rubber brick. Our friend, brick. the block. And um, I have some sanding pads also. The first thing we're gonna do is set up our mandrel and show you how you can take any size ring and get the mandrel ready for it. Excellent. We know that our clay shrinks eight to 10%. Because of that, we have to make sure that we make the ring a size and a half up before we actually put it or around it the mandrel. Fit. Or it won't fit, it'll be a size and a half too small. Okay. So what we do first is get the ring sizer and we're going to put it on one of your fingers. Okay, which, okay. One, which one would you like? Oh, gee. Here, have a pointer. There we go. Now you, oh, actually, that worked really well. That was like magic. It was, it just, and beautiful because it just stops for the briefest moment over your knuckle, so it's not gonna be too big. Excellent. Now that is actually a size six and a half. Oh. Okay, so what we're gonna do, and you'll see on this that there's a little black arrow and it's pointing to the six and a half over on this side. Okay. So what we're going to do is add a size and a half, which means that from six and a half, that's seven and a half and eight. So that means then I widen this to eight. To eight, and that way it will shrink it to fit. It will fit. shrink to fit a Got six it. and a half. So the first thing we do is take the ring sizer on the bare mandrel, and we're going to put it up until it's snug but it's not changing the size, okay. okay? And you can see that there's no air down there. It's nice and snug against there. I'm gonna take your pencil and you're going to make a mark on each side. So you've got two marks. Okay, then you take off this and you can see the mark there. Yep. Okay. Once we've got our size marked on the mandrel, we're going to take a piece of Teflex and just cut a strip about an inch wide and why are we gonna use this? Because once this is around the mandrel, then the clay won't stick. Ah, once it dries, right. it'll just be easy to pull off right. because if it sticks to anything, we can't get it off and yep. you might break it. Now I'm going to go around the mandrel and you can see the two marks right through. So that's another, you had mentioned earlier, having it be Having it be thin, right. It's, it's just really easy to see those marks through. Fantastic. So I'm just gonna cut this, trim this off. If this were so long that I were wrapping it once well, or twice. Well, then you're making it thicker, and then and the ring won't fit there right. There you go. Yeah. Make sure again that it's the right size. 
When I put the tape on this, I'm going to put the tape on the Teflex, not on the mandrel. So it doesn't get stuck. You don't want to stick it right. You want to make sure that it rotates and moves. So I have a little piece of cellophane tape here, piece of tape, and you don't want to make it too big. So again, this goes around. And because this is tapered, you can't make it match the ends exactly. We know it's going to be slightly right. conical. You just have to make sure that it's nice and snug. You don't want it so loose that you've got air down here. Okay. And you're going to burnish it with your thumbnail. All right. And then you gradually rotate it so you can see the two lines right through that. And the two lines, if you did it right, are pretty much in the middle. Awesome. Okay, so you're going to put that strip right, right on those two marks. Them. That's right. Okay. So now that your mandrel is ready, you can see how no matter what size you have, you can put it anywhere on this mandrel. Yeah. And you'll have your ring the right size when it shrinks. Okay. Okay, and I have the slats here, and the slats will prevent me from rolling the strip for the shank thinner than one millimeter. Okay. Because that is really the minimum that you're supposed to roll our clay. All right, now this is half of 50 grams. This is 25 grams of clay, because that's how they package the 50 okay. grams. So really, I only need about 10. All right. And when I open this up, I have an inner pack. So I'm gonna take the moment. Looks like a piece of gum, gray gum. Delicious gray gum. Mm -mm. And this is actually ha has a two year shelf life. Wow. So you don't have to worry about it sitting around. You right. just, and the package seals it back up. And the, right, and you just make sure that you have moisture in there somewhere. Okay. So I've got this, and I am going to, excuse me, put this under my little humidifier. Ah, Remember we talked yes. about that? Yes, okay. Now that will stay there, and I don't have to worry about that drying out or starting to dry out in the time it takes me to put this back in here. Remember the olive oil? Yep. All right, that goes on here. Then I take my clay gum, clay gum, mm -hmm. and I'm going to make it into a log. So you're preforming it into the shape. Right. If I were to keep it in a circle, in a lump, when I went to roll it out, it wouldn't roll out long. It would roll out wide, and then it it wouldn't be wide enough. Okay. I need a, a nice long log. I'm going to put it right on here. All right. My roller. Make sure I've got some olive oil on my roller. All right, then I'm gonna start in the middle. When you have a texture like this, you can't roll really fast back and forth because this will shift, right? shift it, yeah. right. So I'm just, I know I'll have more than enough clay, but I wanna make sure I have. Just to be safe. Yep. There we go. When I lift this up, got a beautiful. Oh, look at that. Got a beautiful texture here. Okay, and I'm gonna bring this to me. Come to me, O-rings. And first thing I'm gonna do is just make sure it's long enough. Of course it is, but I'm just gonna make sure. Okay, so I'm going to cut the ends here. Those are my fat ends. I'm gonna cut them off in my humidifier here. All right, let's do this. All right. Right on that line, and I'm gonna overlap it. Now watch. You see, I've overlapped it. It's not perfect yet, but I've got the two layers there like yeah. that. I'm gonna cut straight across everything at a diagonal because you have more of a surface area. Okay, right. so you're going to just take that clay out now. You'll now this should be the right size. Got it. If I have to trim it a little bit, I have to trim it a little bit. And it's just slightly too long. So I'm just going to trim it a little bit more. So this is what I use when I'm doing rings. I don't use paste first. I use syringe first because the inside um, seam. Yep is the most difficult to get. Oh. So I'm gonna put a lot of syringe. I'm just gonna push it in there and goop it up in there. Okay, and then inch these together. I use the back end of my paintbrush like this. Ah, oh. it's almost like spackling.
It is. It's definitely like spackling. That's why I like using this syringe because it's so much stickier yeah. than the paste. All right, and now I'm gonna smooth it a little bit and add paste. And, and that I'm kind of fills in the crevices? Or? Yes. Yeah, okay. And I'm gonna add a lot of paste because um, when the water evaporates, it shrinks a little bit. Right, okay. And if you don't, then you just have to go back and add more anyway. Now the last thing you can do, there's two ways of doing it, is trimming this down. To make it thinner? To make it thinner. You're going to be drying this and then sanding it again. Okay. So really, you're not worried about getting it absolutely perfect. You can fix some of that in the sanding you and filing. You fix all of it in the sanding and filing. Awesome. You just don't need to mess that much with it because if you do, what's gonna happen, it's gonna get real nasty and start um, cracking and you don't want that. So okay. I'm just making sure that it's seam is nice and tight. Take your time because you don't want this falling apart in the dehydrator. No, that would be bad. So you have the seam up like right. this so that um, you can take a look and if it starts to separate, you can take a look if it's on the bottom, you can't see it until it's wide and then you have trouble if it's already dried. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna get all the rest of the clay together. We wanna keep this clay. Yeah, because we've so gotta, gotta use, use it the, later. All right, so this goes under here. There we go. And now this goes in the dehydrator. Okay. Okay, and I've taken the three trays oh, off of the so bottom. So you can just slip, stick this, it right in on the mandrel. Right, because oh. if you take it off now, it's going to collapse. It's right. not sturdy enough yet. So it goes in here for about five to 10 minutes. While that's drying, uh, we can actually do the top of the mold. Okay. Which is the Celtic heart itself. This is the mold, and we've seen it before, yeah. but like everything else you're going to put clay on, you wanna make sure that you've got some olive oil in here. Not too much, you just have to put enough just to lubricate it. Right. So we're gonna take one of these pinches here of the clay that's being kept nice and moist and push it into the mold. It's really important that you push it into all aspects of this mold because you can have it come over a little bit. You mm -hmm. can have a little extra on the edges because you can, sand it, that. you can sand it, cut it down. I just make sure I've got it all in there. Okay, a little okay. bit extra if I could have you add sure. that. Sure. Then you just turn it over and pop it out. Wow. Okay, so I'm just checking it. Let me set it down here. I can trim just a little bit around because then you don't waste too much in your paste jar. All right, then this goes into the dryer and we'll be able to take the ring off of the mandrel. Okay. Okay, so you never wanna put the black in there, but it can help you carry it to the machine. Okay, so this is going to go here. And then this, is going to come out. All right. And I'm gonna show you how to take it off of the mandrel. Okay. Out of your way. Thank you. You're welcome. When you take it off, you never wanna pull like that because if it does stick for some reason, you can break it. You always wanna put your entire hand over it and just slide the entire uh, thing off. Okay. Okay, then you take this and just pinch this and it should come right out. Okay. We're doing this because anything that was inside against the Teflex hasn't dried yet because the air couldn't get at it. So right now, we're done with the mandrel. I'm gonna put that out of the way. And then this is going to go right next to the other piece and they'll finish drying together. Well, it's been about 10 minutes. Let's see All how right. things are going in the dehydrator. I've got this one. It's dry. Excellent. And this one, which may not be yet. All right. All right, we're gonna take a look at the shank. Uh, because I always put a lot of um, syringe before I put the two ends together, I normally don't have a lot to do with the inside of the ring. On the sides, it's not too bad either. What I will do is get one of these 
Um, this is Superfine, which is um, the second of the four different grits. Okay. And I am just going to very gently go back and forth. And you kind of do like a I do, yeah, circular it motion. It could be a circular cool. motion. I want to be real careful. I'm ambidextrous in ah, sanding wow, so I can, yeah, that's impressive. Neck, clever. But I want to make sure that I just don't do this because if you just grab it around the outside and you're pushing it and it catches, your fingers will go like this and you'll snap Ew, it. that would be bad. And for some reason, physics dictates that it's never just two pieces. It'll always be four or five. But that looks pretty good. That the, looks great. Yeah, if you look at the edges, they're nice and flat. I can't really see where the seam was, which is wonderful. Wow. It's and uh, then I'm going to put my finger inside so that I'm not exerting any pressure. You never want to hold a ring like that because, again, you're trying not to be harsh. This is being really gentle, this hand, and this hand has all the energy in it. And when people break rings, they tend to break them with the non-dominant hand. So we're going to be extra special careful. And that looks good. So that one's ready. This one, I am going to just take a look at this. Um, see if I need a little filing or a little... It really, I'm gonna get my block here. It really looks pretty good. It does look good. I'm just making sure that my design, my Celtic design is in nice shape, which it is. Um, take a little bit of my super fine sanding pad here. Get the edges all nice and pretty because after you put the two together, you don't want to have to put any undue stress on it until okay. it's fired. So you want to make sure that if you have any two parts you're going to put together or three parts or whatever, that each individual part has been worked on until it's pretty. Okay. And then you put them together. Okay, it's looking pretty good. Nice soft top. Good. All right, the back a little bit. And when you're doing something that's flat, you mm -hmm. want flat on the back, it's actually much easier oh, if, you put right. it, if you put it on the uh, sanding pad. Oh yeah, much better. Excellent. All right. Now, to get these two parts together, what you need to do where this is going to be attached to this, you need to flatten this a little bit because right now you see that it's only on one little point. Yeah, you need the maximum surface area you need the for maximum. the adhesion. Exactly. Right. Right. So I'm going to see if I can see where the seam is because that's best to hide right there. But unfortunately... You did such a good job. Oh, look at that. I can't even find the seam. Maybe right there. All right. So I'm going to get a flat edge file, and this, flat, this file is flat on one side, and I am going to hold the ring between my first and thumb. Thumb and forefinger. There you go. And I'm going to just flatten this just a little bit. So I'd say I'm no more than maybe a quarter inch. You don't need a... a big flattening, because you don't want to go so thin right, that you're breaking you through the, the ring. It there you go, you don't want to do that either. Right. So I'm okay. just taking the top off, tapping that and getting some of that stuff off. All right, I think that'll do it. And the way you can check is by balancing it. Oh, okay. look at that. So if it balances, obviously it's got a flat enough surface. When you put the two together, I'm going to use syringe because okay. syringe is the tackiest. Because it's a little thicker than the paste? Correct. Again, like All the right. spackle. And I'm not going to put it on here because I'm not really sure where it's going to attach. So I'm going to put it on here. All right. And again, taking a little bit of the moisture off, I am going to just be real generous and push it together. Now I'm going to look at it from all sides. I'm going to make sure that it's not twisted too much that mm -hmm. way. I'm going to hold it like that. While I'm holding this, I'm going to take a wet paintbrush and I'm just holding it so I can see underneath it because I want to make sure that I get the syringe everywhere underneath. If I need to, I can get a little paste 
and add a little paste to make sure that it's well attached. Because if it's not well attached when you fire it, it's just gonna pop apart. So you really wanna make sure you've got a nice attachment there. And again, you wanna check it from all angles, make sure things haven't moved. Okay, now that I have the two parts together and the seams look really good, I'm going to take the uh, mandrel again. All right. Because if I set this down, it may disturb it until right. it's really set. Um, so I'm just gonna slip it on. I don't need any um, Teflex between them because I'm not gonna put it on tight, just enough to hold it upright. Okay. And this goes back into the dehydrator. Careful. And that should only take five minutes all right. at the most because it's all dry except for that. I think it's ready. Yay! All right. This metal gets very hot, so you have to be careful. Okay. But it's looking really good. Again, you just want to make sure it doesn't get stuck on there. And it's metal, so it does get hot. So when it's in this state, it's called greenware, like porcelain or ceramic, would Correct. Be called, right? Correct, exactly. And uh, greenware means that there's no water in it. Ah. Uh, but it hasn't been fired yet. Okay. Okay, it's looking beautiful. Joint looks nice and firm. So we're ready to fire it. Yay, I'm excited. Now today we're going to fire it with what simulates your gas stove. Okay. So this is the second of three ways of firing art clay. So if you have a gas stove, you can do something similar. You actually have to test it first, and we're gonna do that. Okay. Because what you do first is you test your um, flame, whether it's at home or whether it's a camping stove like this, whatever you do, you, what we're gonna do first is turn on the burner without the clay on it and just see if we get a nice red spot. Okay. Get my long lighter here, cause I'm not gonna be in there with a little match. Sounds, sounds so, wise. Hear that? Oh, I can hear it. Don't blow us up, Jackie Trudy. Nope. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look. And actually, you just stare at it for a minute. Oh, and I what, see it. You see it? Yeah. And I'm going to see, and it's got a stainless steel net over it. So if you're doing it at your house, you put the stainless steel net on top of your burners. Okay. And you make sure that you get a red glow like this. Because if you it. don't, wow. that means you're not going to get a glow on your piece. All right. But this looks good, and it's right about there. So um, I'm going to turn this off for safety. Okay. Safety. And it was right there. Important. So now I'm going to take some tweezers okay. and put it right there. All right, all ready to fire. Are you ready? I'm ready. You're going to be the keeper of the timer again. Oh, it's a very and, big job. And this time we're yes. going to set it for five minutes. All right, five minutes. All right, I'm going to go ahead and light it. You and tell me we'll when talk. you're ready for me to start. Right. Suddenly I'm wanting a some more. <laughs> Can you multitask that way? Okay, let me make sure that things are going to get hot enough. Oh, I see. And it. things are going to yeah. start smoking. Okay. There we go. Yep, yep, I see okay. the flame. We can have the lights down, please. We're not ready yet for the timer. Okay. Because I'm... we're having the same thing where we're going to have the the binders, the binders burning, burning off, off okay. and then the piece is going to glow. It's looking pretty good. I think it's glowing. Yeah, Looks I just glowy. want to monitor it. Okay, uh, now. Okay, five minutes. After five minutes, you actually turn it off and walk away for 20. That 20 minutes gives the sintering process time to complete. Okay. So instead of doing it two minutes with a torch very close, you're going to do it five minutes on your stove top. Right. And then walk away for 20 minutes. You won't quench it and you won't cut short that whole second phase of the uh, sintering process. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. 20 minutes and counting. Okay. We just leave it there. Is it ready? It's ready. It's right. been 20 minutes. So can we have the lights up, please? Here they come. And it's nice and cool. It's been awesome. 20 minutes. So right now, move that off to the side. You can see that it's white, just like it's supposed to be. Okay. And I have... I have them. There you go. I've been keeping them safe for you. You have. Thank you so much. You did a good job. Thank you. I try. 
There we go. And you can see the silver coming up. Oh, look at this. Up. Just every time you do this part, I'm blown away. Every single time. A Celtic design is really nice. It's gorgeous. And here comes my block. And so you're gonna get into every nook, every cranny, every little corner and try to get that brush. Yeah, you can um, do the same polishing process here that we did with the first one, okay. where you can use the burnisher and uh, really shine it up. And I know that we have one already polished and waiting for us. So we're gonna flip to the one that's all done to show okay. you something really special. See, it's very shiny yep. and it's very clean. We cleaned it well with, um, with baking soda, which is what neutralizes all the acids in your fingers and everything. So now we're ready. Okay, let me go ahead and get you your warm water. Okay, and what we're gonna do is get the liver of sulfur. Liver of sulfur. And I'm going to put some in here. Liver of sulfur will change the fine silver uh, colors from amber to gold to um, magenta, blue, and then black. Okay. Depending on how hot the solution is and how um, strong it is. Mm, that smells delicious. Oh, yummy. And I'm gonna put these close together yeah. and then get now this is clean, remember. Right. If you've put your fingers or your hands all over it, you really have to clean it off again with baking soda. So the first thing that will happen as the liver of sulfur gets the silver, gets to the silver, it starts oh, changing it. Oh yeah, I can it. see the color changes. And wow, look at that. And so it will change even if you take it out of the liver of sulfur, it continues to change until you neutralize it. And it does take a little patience. It's easier to show people initially when they haven't been exposed to liver of sulfur. It's better to go slowly, where um, if you've done it a while and you know right. the color changes and you're going directly to black, you just make it hot and you do this once and then it's gone. So what I'm doing here is just keep stirring it a bit and let it get to the really blue color. Okay. Because that means that in the crevices, it's nice and dark. But you can imagine making leaves yeah, and stopping right. it kind of, kind of here when it's, look at the, I mean, look yeah, at the gorgeous magenta and blue. Very beautiful. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put this in here. All right. I'm gonna take some baking soda just to neutralize this in the studio here so it's not so nasty. And that should be okay. And now I'm just gonna take this, take my finger, Neutralize it. So that's stopping the process from continuing. Correct. Otherwise, it'll keep going, okay. which is okay. But we just we don't we don't have the time to mess around. Then I'm going to dry it off. Unless you want to leave the entire piece this color. I mean, it's a pretty color, but to show you what you really should do with liver of sulfur and what it's meant for, is to take off the top of the. Um, liver of sulfur and so just it leave it in, in the, the crevices. recessed areas. Right, because then you can really see the contrast with right. the design. So I'm just going to take my um, stainless steel brush. And this is where we're going to use some polish as well. Okay. So I'm just going to brush this so that the liver of sulfur is off on the top. Just like that. I have here a polishing cloth, polishing cloth. and some metal polishing medium. This is my favorite, favorite, favorite polishing. And I know I've got to do this quick because I know this bothers you. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm a little sensitive. She is. Margo is our sensitive, sensitive artist. <laughs> but I used a very, very little. You don't need a lot, it's kind of... No, you don't a need a lot at all. Do you, right? So I'm just rubbing the front of the ring. Wow, And you can that. see where the yeah. silver's back. But inside the crevices, it's still all um, black from the liver of sulfur so that it really lets you see the contrast. I love it. 
And what you want to do again is the last thing you want to do is go back with the baking soda. Okay, so you get a goodly amount in here. I'm going to keep swirling this around the water and drying it until, until we have it at the place we want it, where we have enough of the old patina and enough of the, shiny the new shiny silver yeah. left, right. You get that nice contrast. Yeah. One more time. And then I think we'll be set. Okay. Oh, that's beautiful. I love it, Jackie. Good, I do too. I think it shows the patina very nicely in the cracks and crevices and uh, the silver comes out on the top. So we finished our second project. We're done with number two. All right, we're ready for number three, the butterfly filigree earrings. And now we're ready for our third and final project, the butterfly earrings. Let's get started, Jackie. All right, let's go through uh, the equipment we're going to need. Sure. There's not a lot here. This is basically the design. It is a butterfly. And as you can see, the line is fairly dark and we're going to follow these lines with the syringe. So you're only using the syringe and paste for this. Oh, cool. And this is why we really like these Teflon sheets very, very thin, because you can see right through wow. it and you're able to follow it. So you're almost tracing the lines with the You're clay. tracing the lines with the syringe. So we're gonna use the syringe and I've got okay. the green tip on it. And the green tip is the medium tip. It's the one that's used most often. Okay. And it's really important that you keep it clean, keep the end clean and keep the end from getting all banged around. So you never wanna drop it in the water. You wanna just place it in. Um, I've got a paintbrush yep. here that we're going to use because we'll need some paste at every junction when we're done with a layer. Oh, okay. And some tweezers because you never know when you're going to need them. Same thing with the craft knife because as you're doing this, you may have a few spots where you want to take a little bit off and it's easier to do it with the tip of the craft knife. Okay. Um, again, just in case you have to touch something, it's better to have a little olive oil on the tip of your finger. Right. I've got, again, a couple of files here because before you fire it, you are gonna go over it and make sure that you don't have a lot of uh, sharp tips. And the last thing is this design calls for two four millimeter fireable stones. I have here a couple of natural garnets and these will be fine because they're going to be in the kiln. And I'll show you exactly how to do it. So now we can get ready to start making the project, right? Okay, yeah, it's not uh, not difficult. Um, there are a couple of tips with the syringe. Okay. And I don't mean green or blue, I mean <laughs> suggestions. Helpful hints. Helpful hints. One is make sure when you take it out of the water that you have a paper towel because you wanna make sure you roll the syringe to get all the excess moisture off. There's oh. nothing worse than coming here and having this big blob of water come. Yeah, that would be bad. It's very bad. People hold the syringe differently. I hold the syringe like this, where I'm just very You're gently. You're kind of cupping it in your hand. And yeah, using and I'm thumb. using my thumb, basically. Okay. Um, if you do like this, you really don't have a lot of control and your hand hides it. So if you're doing this and you're on the side, then you can see where you're going. Okay. The other thing is, when you're doing projects that are entirely syringe, you wanna make sure that they're as high and as pristine as you can make them. So you wanna make sure that you start, and I'm just gonna do a demo here, that you start, you lift up, and you stop, and you touch down. Okay. And that, you can see that you've got the full height. Otherwise, what people normally do is they do this, and, and, you, can, thin, yeah, and, and you can see it's all dragged around, and, right. and when you do three layers, it just doesn't work. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna clean this off, and then I'm gonna look at this, I've got a butterfly, and I'm going to do away from me first, and then move toward me, so that I don't have the opportunity of sliding my hand through it. Okay. Okay, and I tend to turn this around, which is why it's not taped to the table, but it's taped to something that I can turn around because I don't wanna go this way. I'm always gonna go in the same direction right. so I can see. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna start in the middle here, touch down, lift up, and I'm gonna keep 
pressing with my thumb until I get to where I want to go. Stop, touch down, and then I'm ready to go again. If you're like me and you have a, an age thing going with the eyes, <laughs> Um, you can use a, um, an optivizer or okay. an other kind of uh, magnification device because for sure, um, after a while, using these little lines and stuff, it can become very difficult. Again, I physically lift my thumb up to stop. Once you get this, it can go very quickly. And no one says that you have to stay absolutely on the line. I like to color outside of the lines. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> And so I'm just leaving a lot of room because on the top here, I have three circles. The middle big circle is what's going to hold the garnet. The mm -hmm. okay. So I'm just going to make this as big as I can. Once, you're, once you've done one layer, you don't need the picture anymore underneath it. So it's nice to take it off so it doesn't confuse you when you're doing subsequent oh, layers. Right. Okay, that makes sense. When you press this, if it starts wandering off out of here, it usually means that the tip has gotten bent or dirty. So just keeping it clean like that makes a huge difference. All right. It's just, it's like icing a cake. It is. There are some people who do cake decorating who do extremely well with this. The big thing I would imagine is keeping the pressure even as you're yeah. working so that you don't get blobs. Um, yeah, and starting and stopping. A lot of people have a hard time remembering to lift up their thumb, and they wind up with these really long tails of yeah. uh, syringe. That would be the kind of thing I would do. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it comes like anything else. It just comes with practice. practice. And you can fix things here because it's still wet. Oh, you can right. fix you can a lot in, of you can things. Turn stuff off, oh, you can, absolutely. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, if you want, because this is Teflex, remember, things don't stick. So you can go in if something isn't quite right and push it aside and round it off. And if you have tails, you can pick them up. You can do all kinds That's of things. Really neat. You just have to make sure that you either cover the tip up or don't take more than a few seconds. Because you don't want that extra stuff extruding. If that dries in here. Oh, you are doomed, okay. doomed. I don't want to be doomed, Jamie. No, no dooming. So, and you have to make sure that your light is really good so that you don't get a lot of shadow because you want to be seeing what you're supposed to be seeing. So don't do this in a candlelit room. Uh, preferably not. <laughs> You are really precise. Oh, thank you. Well, I've done a few of these. This isn't your first time at the rodeo, huh? No. People don't want to look at the bottom of their piece because the bottom, this is the bottom layer. Right. So by the time they're doing the third layer, they're pros. Almost done. If you have to practice first, don't be intimidated because this, um, you know, you, you need some practice. And right. I've told people the best way to practice is to get some, not gel, but the regular consistency of toothpaste. Yes. And put toothpaste into an empty syringe. Oh, well, no, that's a good idea. And that way you can practice and get the tension right. And, yeah, and you're not, you're not losing silver. Clay. Yeah, because right. you don't want to waste silver. Now, you could take, if you did make a mess up, you could put it into your paste, but oh, yeah. can you? you can. Oh, sure. Okay. As a matter of fact, I've got this stuff right here that can go right into my paste. There we go. Okay, get that out of the way. All right. All right, back to almost being done. Now I've got the two antenna. So I'm just going to take a little bit more time so they're nice and plump. So all of these little points on the design need to connect. Yes. So if you're p picking a design and you're not doing this design, you want to pick something where every little edge connects you're together absolutely so that right. you don't have any dangling. And that's also very important. Okay. okay, so this is going to go in there. Now, you can see that they're not 
perfect. I've got little tails on some and, and some didn't even reach the other side. It's because my old eyes. So I'm going to take my paste and I'm going to put a dot of paste on every joint. So it's almost acting like a little solder. Yes, in effect it is. And it's really important because if it's not really, even if it's touching, but it's not wet, it may not stick when oh. you fire it. And to go through all of this and to have your pieces, you know, pop apart is not really good. That would be sad. So um, you just get, I just am not pretty with it. You know, I'm just getting a, a nice big blob. Well, and this is your bottom layer. And so. this is the bottom layer. It's really important that it's it's intact. And you find out that you, even though you try to go exactly on top with each subsequent layer, that you're off just a little bit. Okay. So you just have to let it roll and watch <laughs> what you're doing. Okay. And you've got to be methodical about how you're connecting them. Okay. You just don't want to forget. But because the paste is fairly thick, if you have like a little gap, you can just put a lump of syringe in there and it oh. will actually just stay. After you're done with this, it goes in the dehydrator. Each layer takes very little time because it's they're thin. And they're so thin. But you have to make sure that you don't put it um, way back where the fan is because it's so light, the first layer is so oh, light, you won't want it to away. blow away. The first time that happened to me, I almost cried because it just was gone. Oh. It's so thin. It really needs, when you're doing syringe all by itself, you really, really need three layers. Okay. So I'm done. I'm done with the layer. So um, I'm gonna put this in the dehydrator. Okay. And once this is done, and I take this away, I'm not gonna need this picture underneath anymore. Okay, here we are. It's dried and it's still extremely delicate because there's okay. only one layer. So we're going to actually do the exact same thing. And this is the tough part for a lot of people because you're supposed to go right on top of the second layer. Oh, so you, okay. have, to, you have to definitely stay in the lines. You have to definitely case. stay in the lines. And so normally you use your, um, your paintbrush to move things in Okay. and uh, you just keep your eye on the ball. All right, this is the part where I'm going to do the three circles, the largest of which is gonna have a stone in it. When it's the second layer like this, this is when you put the stone in. So you're almost sandwiching it between two layers. Absolutely. All right. And so what I will do is you don't wanna wait till you're done very end because this will be already hard. So you wanna do it while it's still soft because when you drop the stone in, it's going to um, kind of settle into place. All right. The stone is upside down on its table, right. flat part of the stone. I'm grabbing it by the girdle, and then I'm gonna turn it upside down so that it's going to go in point first. Okay. Wow. And I just tap it to make sure it's in flat. And that's that, then I keep going. Okay. I'm not gonna cover it up, I'm not gonna lock it in place yet. So you don't do anything with the um, with the stones that are in place. You just let them sit and dry in their little cubby holes. Okay. When we do the third layer, we're going to lock them in. All right. So um, another couple of minutes in the dehydrator, and then we'll do the third layer. So we dried our second layer, and now it's time for the third and final layer. And this is the most important layer because oh, the this most is important layer. most important because this is the one that's going to lock in these stones. Right. Okay. So. Most of you know that uh, on a stone, the widest part of the stone is called the girdle. And with art clay, you need to make sure that that girdle is in the clay. So when the whole piece shrinks during firing, it locks onto the stone so the stones don't come out. Okay. Okay. So we've got to make sure when we do this that we don't necessarily cover up the table, but we get all around the periphery. So we're going to be real careful when we uh, are at that area. And I do that pretty much first off okay, that so that they sense. don't, if I don't hit it, it doesn't fly somewhere. So I am just making sure everything is in place, looks good, and here we go. Okay. 
All right, I'm gonna double check, make sure my stones have stuff all around them, and they do. All right, into the dehydrator, and then you're gonna see us just finish up with it, and we'll be ready to fire. So we've got our three layers, and now what's the next step? Well, the last step really is to make sure that you've got three distinct layers here, yes. and you're never gonna make them indistinct. Okay. But what you have to do is look in the corners for little holes and look for oh, places okay. where it might be separated because you've got to turn three layers into one. All right. Because with arc clay, if you don't have them connected, um, they might fire separately. Oh. So I'm just going through with some paste and my paintbrush and it shouldn't take more than a minute or so to do this. You're not gonna try to um, make the three layers disappear because that won't happen, but you can make sure that they're filled in. You can always sand a little bit afterwards, so it's better to put more on than less. All right. So I'm just looking in between, and if I see anything where I see three layers that are separate, I'm just going in to put a little bit of um, paste in there. All right. But this looks pretty good. So I've gone around the periphery, done that. Everything else is looking pretty good. And so one last time into the dehydrator, and in just a couple of minutes, we'll be done. So we had it in the dehydrator for five more minutes. Mm -hmm. It's dry, and is it ready to fire? We're all ready to go, and I have made sure that my stones have been brushed off with a dry brush so that there's no paste or syringe left on them to fire onto all the right. stone. right, and you, you can go through with a file and any kind of sharp edges or anything you can refine. Absolutely, and so you just wanna make sure that there's nothing really sharp because otherwise it's gonna get much sharper. Now, we're going to use the kiln to fire this because this is all low fire clay and syringe that's been used. Okay. The paste is 650, and you can see on the syringe package it says 650, and that means that it actually fires at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Now garnets usually can be torch fired, but when you put them in a kiln, you really should go a little bit lower than that. So um, you can fire at 1200 degrees for 30 minutes, Okay. or you can fire at 1472 for five minutes. So we're actually gonna fire this, and we're just gonna put this on the board. All right. This is a fiber board, it's been pre-fired. And you don't have to do anything to it, just put it on the uh, fiber board that's in there. And now you can see on this kiln that there's actually just one button that you press to move forward. And CMPL means complete. So right okay. now it's ready to start. It's ready to roll. Right. So now it's at idle. Okay, and the temperature that comes up is supposed to be the ambient temperature. Program one is what we're going to be doing. And the ramp RA means how fast is it going to go up? I want it to go up all the way, as fast as it can go, because you don't need to go up slow. If you okay. had a big piece of glass or a big uh, piece of porcelain, you might have to go slower than full because so you don't want to shock. Full speed ahead here. Right. So I'm just raising this until it gets to full. full. And full means it's going to go up as fast as it can go. Okay. The next one is the Fahrenheit. What temperature do you want to stop? And we wanted to stop at 1472. 1472. Right. And these uh, kilns are so easy to program. It's kind of like doing your microwave. And HLD is hold. How long do we want to hold this at 1472? Five minutes. Five minutes. minutes. There we go. Start, yes, on. And now it's gonna do its thing. And now it's gonna do its thing. And it's going to take probably maybe 20 minutes to get up to temperature, not even. Okay. And you can hear the element click on. All right. Okay, so it's going to alarm. We'll come back when it's done. We'll show you how to polish it up right. with no problems We're almost whatsoever. there. We are. So we kiln fired it and now we're ready to finish up. Yep, it uh, alarmed off when it was done, and I pressed the little start-stop button. Okie dokie. And um, you can let it cool down just slightly. You really can't quench anything that's got a stone in it. Okay. Because if you put it from hot into the cold water, the stones will fracture. So you really have to kind of let it cool. All right. But you can take the shelf out. And it's safe to put it on top because these paints are all you know, heat safe. heat safe. So what I'm gonna do is take my tweezers and take a look. See, it's white, just like everything else we've yeah. done until you brush it. 
It's been sitting there a little bit, so it's not hot. Okay, good. Okay, so because this is so delicate, mm -hmm. I would not brush this real extensively. Okay. Because if you catch any one of these little cells with the, um, with the brush, you could really break them. All right. So what I do is I just really, really lightly off, just off the surface, get, um, get the silver just so I can tell it's silver. Mm -hmm. And then this time we're gonna use the tumbler, the rotary tumbler. Okay. So I'm gonna talk real briefly about that. You can put any stones in here. It does take a little bit longer for silver. It's at least an hour and a half. Okay. Rolling around with, um, with shot. And this is called stainless steel mixed shot. And the mixed means it's different shapes. So I have in here two pounds of stainless steel shot. I've got the piece that I want to tumble, okay. and I said I was going to really lightly, and I mean lightly, go over this. Lightly? Lightly. Okay. That was it. Just to clarify. Just. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anything else you need, you could get about a big substantial handful of jewelry in here. And then you fill it up between um, one half and two thirds full of water so okay. that it's about two thirds full. Then you, the way you put this particular type of tumbler together, there's a lid in here and you put it in snug. All right. Okay, like that. And then this is the gasket. And this goes around here and this keeps this tight together so it, so it doesn't leak. So it creates pressure and, and doesn't seals leak. everything right. up. But you gotta be careful because if you're not, you know, have somebody help you that can do this, otherwise you might go flinging it around the room. No one wants to be smacked in the head with a gasket. That would be <laughs> unfortunate. So that's all you do. And if it's nice and dry to begin with, this won't leak at all. Wow. Okay, so this just sits here. We had a timer like this and when the I was mystery, a kid. The mystery person is going to turn it on the for us. The mystery person. Mm -hmm. Wow. How about that? And that's all it does. I've got it on a nice rubber pad so it doesn't so make any sound. it's not noisy. Sound. Right. It's not noisy at all. Sometimes I'll put it on a towel if I take it to a convention or something. Okay. And it just goes around and around. And what happens is every time the steel shot hits the piece, it pushes up. And remember we said the flatter the silver, the oh, shinier it was. Okay. Yes. So it'll just go flatter and flatter and flatter. And after at least an hour and a half, sometimes two, three hours if you forget, Right. Um, you just bring it out, rinse it real well, and you'll see a shine that you just don't believe. So this is one that has been tumbled for at least an hour and a half. Amazing, look at that. Look at the shine. That is gorgeous. To do that by hand would have been almost impossible. Oh yeah, and you would have damaged something. Right. Yeah. So this is a, what a tumbler will do, and you can see that it, it's very sturdy, and it's still got the three layers in it, but it's just really, really shiny and nothing you could have done by hand. Wow, I love it. So to make it an earring, the last thing we would do would be to attach it to a finding? Mm-hmm. And I just happen to have some here. What, what a miracle. It is a miracle. All right, so I just have a little ear wire here and I've got my chain nose pliers and I'm just gonna gently open this up. <laughs> And I'm gonna slide this right on, and there's actually a little hole here at the top of the earring. And then I'm gonna close it up, like so, and we're finished. It's absolutely spectacular. Thank you. Well, okay, so we have finished our third project. We've done three fabulous art clay projects. Let's go ahead and review what we've learned. We began our creative journey using the slow dry clay to create the bold and beautiful summertime leaf pendant, which we molded, sanded, torch fired, polished, and finished with colorful beaded accents. Next, we created the stunning custom fit Celtic heart ring using slow dry syringe and paste type clays formed on a mandrel, fired in a gas stove burner, and patinated with liver of sulfur. Finally, we made delicate gemstone accented butterfly filigree earrings with three layers of syringe clay formed on a template, fired in a kiln, and tumbled to a high polish. Jackie, thank you so much for introducing us to the wonderful world of art clay. We've made one-of-a-kind works of art. Yes, we have, and each one is 99.9 .9 fine silver. Thank you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to look for our new series of DVDs you can find at jewelschool.com. We'll be making chic and stylish necklaces, bracelets, and a variety of fashion accessories. 
It's fun, it's fast, it's fabulous. I'm Marga Potter. Catch you next time on Jewel School.